thank you for inviting me. One of the common questions is what fly do I use? And that's kind of what this uh, presentation is about, taking the time to start to learn the insects that the trout are designed to eat. As you develop your skills, entomology will broaden your ability to catch fish at greater different times, whatever the conditions are. Also, it kind of deepens your appreciation for what's going on. And we're going to take a look at three out of the four most commonly fished aquatic insects. That's mayflies, caddis, and stone. The reason why we're doing mayflies, it is probably one of the most beloved flies of the trout. It's a very important species because the trout around here are going to eat 50% of their calories between March and May. Their eggs are laid in the water, not the land. That's a terrestrial. And when they hatch, you got to remember, one egg ball off of a mayfly has 800 eggs in it. The insect drops the egg ball in the water, it sinks, and when it gets wet it turns sticky and it adheres to a rock. And then those eggs are going to hatch. And they hatch at the same time. That's their way they survival is hatching mass. And so the fish are trying to eat them before they can get away. And the way that the insects survive is having thousands of them hatch at the same time, so some of them survive and reproduce. Uh, when they do, that is what we call a nymph. And this is what it looks like. All right, This is going to live in the water. If it's a mayfly, it's going to live in the water one year. If everything is perfect, we don't have any weather issues, most mayflies live about 363 days. And they are adults. That's what the adult looks like. They've got upright wings kind of a, a tapered body. They're very graceful flyers. They'll live maybe two days like that because they don't have a working mouth. They can't eat or drink. So they're going to hatch this guy right here after about a year. A lot of people say they swim to the surface. That's actually not true. Most of them just end up getting um, forced to the surface because they produce a gas under the exoskeleton and they can't not go to the surface. It floats them to the surface. When they hit the surface, that exoskeleton will break open. This guy crawls out. Now this is why the mayfly is such a fun thing to fish. When this guy crawls out of the exoskeleton and he's on the top of the water, he can't fly away right away. He's got to get those wings stretched out and then they have to dry, which makes him a super easy target for a trout. All right, and then he's going to drift away, and then after he gets to the point where his wings are uh, dry enough, they will fly away, find some vegetation, and then eventually they mate, lay the eggs, and they die. That is called a spinner fall. Here's an overview of some of the stuff we're going to look at. I'm going to speak in family groups mainly. But here's some uh, fishermen terms, the Hendrickson's, Solfers, Little Solfers. These are all the same family group, folks. They behave the same. The Hendrickson is the only oddball. All three of the sulfurs, there's actually three different species, look exactly the same, they're just different sizes. The Hendrix is also in the same family group, the only thing different is it's brown or red. We're going to look at Marks Browns, Cahills, Gray Fox, Blue Quills, that was actually that insect I showed you at the beginning here. They're very, very important around here because they're the, probably the first hatch that comes off reliably. The red quills, actually that should be up with the Hendrickson. Red quill is actually just the Hendrickson. And then the blue wing olive. You guys heard of the blue wing olive? Okay, there's actually over 60 different bugs that represent that. Now that's what I'm telling you. Like these flies here represent lots of different insects. You don't have to have every little teeny weeny blue wing olive to catch them on blue wing olives. Now here's something I also want to talk about, and I'm going to preface this. Different may uh, mayfly patterns. There's the Catskill style, the Comperdon, the Thorax Dun, the Parachute. All right, Blue Quill. These are the Paraleptos. Um, these are extremely abundant in our rivers because uh, we have a lot of gravel. That's where they like to hang out. You're not going to find them in the super fast water. You're going to find them in the, in the gravelly water, riffles, things like that. When they hatch, they hatch in mass. All right, it's a simple fly. It's about a size 16 or an 18 around here. You can nymph fish them. You can dry fly fish them. I particularly like to do the dry fly. 
This is the classic pattern for, for that. This is the first thing you're going to see. I've seen it as early as January. Typically, it's going to be around March. A lot of it has to do with sunlight and temperature. And I will tell you this, when you're out fishing early or even in the winter, the key is if you can find a situation where you've got not one sunny day where the temperature is around 45 degrees, not two days, but the third day of 45 degrees, you're going to have a good fishing day, even in the middle of winter. Our fish will key in after three days of steady 45 degree temperatures and sun. And they will be very active and they're going to feed very heavily at that point. And uh, it makes for great dry fly fishing in the winter. In our area, we have all the same flies that you read in the, in the major books that talk about hatches, except ours are the smaller version of them. So if you read in the book, you say, well, the March Brown is a size 10. You should be fishing 12s and 14s. This is the pheasant tail, and a size 16 or an 18. It's a very productive pattern. Have some with a flashback. Have some without it. Can't answer the question why. Some days the flashback works really well. Some days it doesn't. If your shellback is black, the trout will select for that one. That's your first mayfly. So when that water temperature hits 50, you better be fishing. Because that's when everything really starts to roll. Because you've got to remember, not only are the insects really starting to hatch, but when that water temperature goes up, it kicks the metabolism of the trout in high gear, and they have to start feeding. When it gets super cold, the trout can go three months. When it's 38 degrees in our rivers, it can go three months without eating a single thing and lose no biomass. Because its, it's metabolism is completely shut down. So what you're trying to do is, is match bug activity and fish activity okay and in the springtime with the blue quills you're looking at you know 50 degree water temperature now when the blue quills are going off you also want to keep an eye on this guy this is the quill gordon now the uh, quill gordon fly is basically part of the eporus family now these guys are a little bit odd they actually emerge on the bottom of the river so their exoskeleton breaks open and then they swim to the surface with wings. They're folded back. This fly is what made wet fly fishing so famous. Because the wet fly imitates that bug going to the surface that's already split its exoskeleton. Okay. So you can do wet fly fishing in the spring with the, the porous. But the thing about this is so nice, you've got two really good things going on. This is a big fly. You can fish size 10s, 12s. When this thing is coming off, you will have big fish coming up and eating it greedily. This is your, probably the best time of the year to catch a big fish on a dry fly because A, they need the calories, they haven't eaten all winter, and two, this is like a T-bone steak to a trout. All right, I, I was watching a, a nice porous hatch one time, and they don't hatch in mass, all right? They don't hatch in mass like the blue quail, but they'll pop and then pop. And then pop, pop, you know. And every single one of those suckers, they pop and they flutter. Because remember, they've come to the surface already open. Their wings, they've swam through the water. Every single one of them was eaten. The other thing that's nice about it, what happens in the spring, is you have high off-color water. Trout can't see that well. All right? That's why, like in the early season, I tell people, use 4X. All right? You are not going to get the break-offs. But they can't see it as well. I'd never use 4X in the middle of summer. But you put a number 12 of this with a 4X, and man, you've got a big trout landing machine at that point. You know, it's a, it's a great combination if you can find them. It's a little sporadic. Some years they come off in great numbers. Some years they don't. Now, here's the famous blue wing olive. There's tons of them. Uh, just remember, it's a small mayfly. They're typically like size 16 to size 26 and they've got some sort of shade of green to them. Now actually North Carolina is, is, used to be famous because there was one of the species, the Pseudocorline Carolina was actually found in North Carolina. If you fish the Mitchell River, you've seen these guys because it's loaded with them. Uh, it's great fall hatch. I mean, it's carpet hatch when these things come off, but they're super small, they're like a size 24. Always have a few blue wing olives in your vest. 
because they're multi-brood. Some of them come off twice a year. It's one of the only mayflies where you'll have two broods, or basically two, two times where they hatch. Most, in, most mayflies, it's just once. The other thing is we've got over 60 species. I forget what it is. So you, you could run into them any time of the year. And the blue-wing olives tend to hatch most prolific on overcast or slightly drizzly days. So if you've got an overcast day, it's, it can be awesome. It's a great one to fish, um, and keep an eye on that. It's, an, it's another springtime one, but I've seen them in the summer, and they're also heavy in the fall. So you've got to kind of match what you're doing. The Quill Gordon that we just saw fishes really good in the Catskill style because they love the fastest water. The Aporis are a, basically what we call them a clinger nymph. Uh, they will live in the absolute fastest water. And so you want to have a fly that's very buoyant, all right? And that's what the Catskill does. It gives a really high profile. It floats well, and, um, and that's why I would use it. I would not use that kind of a fly on still water, all right? That's not what it's meant for. All right, the McCaffreyan. Uh, these are the March Browns. This is what they look like as a nymph. Now, I want to point this out because this is a classic clinger. They're going to live in very fast water. They're very flat, very wide, and actually these limbs and their body is a hydrofoil. When the water goes over top of these bugs, it actually presses them down on the rock and allows them to hold on to slippery rocks in extremely fast current. Now the March Brown is, uh, is a great hatch, but I'm going to tell you it's also a sporadic hatch. You're not going to see a huge number of them come off all at the same time. In our area, I, I think uh, in New York, I saw one big hatch of them um, where they came off in, in fairly large numbers, but it's a great searching pattern in, in, in May. April, May, sometime in there, when they start to come off, depending on the temperature, you can just throw a, a March Brown dry on and just cover water that looks like it might have a fish, and it's a great searching panty because they're used to seeing them sporadically. So they'll eat them at any point during the day. So this would be like, you know, going on, tying a, an attractor fly on, but you're actually matching a hatch. Does that make sense? So it's one of the few, like I would not tie a blue-wing olive and do, go search. All right, I'm going to match a hatch of blue-wing olive. With the March brown in the spring, hey, if I want to fish dries, I'll throw the March brown on. I'll just walk the river fishing because they're popping here and there, and, and the fish are used to that. All right. Uh, but if you see these guys, pick up a rock, take a look, and you see these guys, they'll immediately crawl to the back side, so you've got to be quick. Hendrickson's, the F. Morellas. This is what the natural looks like. Now, the Hendrickson is one of the few mayflies that actively swims to the surface. All right, when you see it, like in a video of it, it's actually going like this as it goes up. Now, it can be... Maddening when you see a Hendrickson hatch um, on some rivers because you'll see the bugs on the surface and you'll see what you think are rises and you're fishing a Hendrix dry, which is a red quill or whatever. You can't catch a fish. They're not eating the dries. They're picking off the nymphs before they get to the surface. So you need to go back to nymphing. And a lot of times, I'll, I'll tell you, you've got to swing the fly. You've got to fish downstream, cast quarter, lift that fly up like it's going to the surface, and that's when you're going to get the hit, folks. Most people, you know, the trout comes up, eats the bug, they're going to go back down, and actually they eat it a second time down here, folks. If you're dry fly fishing, they take it twice. They take it here, but they barely have it. You've got to wait till it comes down here. Then they take it deeper, and that's when you set the hook. If you set the hook before that, it comes out. But what you're seeing on the Hendrix, and this will also happen with the sulfurs, is that trout never came to the surface. He came, picked the bug off about 12 to 18 inches below the surface. As he went down, he wags his caudal tail, and you get what looks like a rise. It's called a boil. The fish never broke the surface, but the force of his caudal tail caused a disturbance on the surface that fools a lot of people thinking he ate at the dry. So I found, particularly around, um, has anybody fished the Green River? Okay, the Green River stinks for dry fly fishing. I don't know why, but the fish there will not come to the surface. I think it's because of all the herrings that live there. 
And when, but they have a big Hendrickson hatch. If you can get there, it's great nymph fishing. Now these are the sulfurs. You know, they're all going to be about the same. Every river is going to be a little bit different though. If you go to the Holstein River, they're going to have a lot of orange in them. If you come and fish on the Davison, they're going to be more of a pale yellow. I like to fish the sulfur hatch on the Elk River in, in West Virginia. They're, they've got a dark yellow to them and they have an orange egg sac. And that orange egg sac is very important. Because the one thing about the sulfurs, their hatch coincides with the spinnerfall. So a lot of times you will have emerging insects at the same time yesterday's hatch is coming to lay eggs. And it can be maddening because the fish can switch from a, an adult to a spinner very, very quickly. When those spinners hit the water, they're flat. You cannot see them. But this looks like a neon sign to a trout. Because you've got to remember, everything that the trout sees is haloed. So the spinner wings are translucent. So you can't see the spinners, and you don't know what the trout are eating. You see the duns, but no, they're not eating them. They're eating the spinners. Because they can see them way better than you can. Sizes on these range from 14 to 18. And, and basically that's all you need. When I first moved here, there's a famous fly called the Yellow May. There's another fam famous one called Jim Charlie. And they are Yellow May flies. And everybody's like, yellow, yellow, yellow. But well, I'm going to let you know the secret. Why is yellow such a big color around here? Because most of the Aporus mayflies, and they hatch early spring all the way through summer, because we've got a lot of different species. When you look at them from above, they look brown. So everybody throws a brown mayfly on. If you turn them upside down, their bellies are yellow, just like the sulfurs. Okay, so I tie my Eporus nymphs banded brown and yellow. So I've got both colors in there. My Eporus, my Quill Gordon, it's gray and yellow because its body's gray to us. When we look down on it, it's gray, but the belly is yellow. So that's what the fish see. Here's another McCaffrey. Um, and this is the Cahill. You see how it's brown here? If you flip it upside down, you know what its belly is? Yellow. yellow. Mark's brown's that way too. It's a creamy yellow. Okay, this is a very, very, probably one of the more popular patterns. I think uh, nationally, the, Mar the Adams and the Cahill are the two most popular patterns sold. All right, so it covers a lot of bases. Uh, Cahills, we have a lot of people fish Cahills all summer because guess what? This actual bug, the fly that matches it, will match other flies that you see in the summertime, which are not the same bug. It's, the, it's another one of the Aporas. Quick review, early spring, you're going to need a size 18 blue quill. That's just a gray fly um, or a pheasant tail. The uh, next fly you're going to see is the quill gordon. I tie mine with yellow and gray. And then when you get into uh, the next one, it's going to be Hendrickson's, March Browns, and then the sulfurs. And that's about it. You can get into a lot of different things. But you can cover a lot of those mayflies with just a yellow, a brown, and a gray. And most of your sizes are going to be between 12 and 18. Okay. All right, we're going to talk about caddis flies now. Um, but you see these little things right here? Those are not warts on the rock. Those are actually bugs. Those are called glossosomids. It's a very primitive uh, caddis fly, but it's an abundance in our water. We have a lot of them. Uh, caddis, there's a lot of different flies. There's a lot more caddis than there are mayflies, but actually for an angler, it's easier. All right, because you can, you can imitate it with just a few patterns. They've got three stages in life. They've got a larva, a pupa, and adult. We're not talking a nymph anymore. This can be important because you can catch fish on the larva. You can catch them on the pupa. You can catch them on the adult. And sometimes you can only catch them on one of those life stages. So it can be maddening in that if they're focused on the pupa and all you have is a larva or an adult pattern, you're not going to catch a fish. Now the difference here is the, the larva is going to be down on the bottom of the stream, crawling around and typically around here. They're algae eaters or they're dentritophores. That means they eat dead plant material. Our fall caddis are dentritophores. They eat the dead leaves that fall on the river. It's essential to maintain oxygen balance. Okay. But when they hatch, they don't actually hatch. They form a cocoon in the bottom of the river. 
And you can actually, if you find these, you can pull them over and, and, and flip them over and you can see inside and you can see the pupa starting to form. When the pupa hatches, it's going to be kind of a combination between the larva and the adult. It's going to have some stunted wings, some long antenna, long appendages. The thing about the pupa is they swim to the surface very rapidly. All right, now they will take breaks along the way, but they're going to swim very rapidly. This is a great time to fish downstream, swinging and rising a pupa pattern. Uh, you were asking about dry dropper. In caddis season, which is more summertime, I don't really fish caddis until June, um, but when the caddis start coming out, a dry dropper where you have an adult and a pupa is really, really good. Early spring, you can fish the larva because they're, they're down in there, folks. And right now, uh, at the end of summer, that is a big time to fish the larva pattern. We've got lots of caddis that are starting to grow and the larva patterns will produce, all right? And that's super easy one to tie. But these guys have a tent-like pattern. It's not like a stonefly. This is where people get confused. It's tent-like. Stoneflies lay their wings one on top of the other flat. These are tent-like and they have a different profile from below. You can see it. Um, they're also very erratic flyers and they have an extended abdomen and it's, it's uh, it's reverse taper. A mayfly gets thinner near the tail. A caddis actually gets thicker near the tail. There are two types. You have case and you have free living. Some will build cases like this guy. Some don't. Uh, most of them are algae eaters. Um, you can actually identify a caddis down to the species because their cases are so specific. Uh, these are a member of the granum. They're actually, as you can see right there, it's a little bit uh, green. They're very, very bright green as the larva, uh, and the Watauga has a bunch of them. It's a good river for them. This is what you call a larva pattern. The only difference is I've pulled that case. See, he's right there, the empty case. I pulled him out, and he's over here now. <laughs> okay. The case and the uncased, the larva actually looks the same, folks. There's no difference. So you don't have to have a pattern for a case caddis and an uncased caddis. All right. This is the pupa right here. I said it has a uh, kind of a stunted wing, long antenna. There's appendages. Some of them actually swim. Here's an example of an artificial. The fish will actually hit very near the surface. And what happens is these guys expend a lot of energy swimming up through the water. And they'll have to rest every once in a while. And a lot of times when they rest, they have a tendency to have neutral buoyancy. That means they're going to float at that same level until they start going up again. And so you'll see fish come up and eat them, and you'll see these guys resting, and you can see them. They actually, their bodies extend and contract, all right, as they're resting. Um, but you gotta, they'll fool you on that. Here is uh, a fall pattern. Now, everybody knows about the October caddis. The October caddis is a huge caddis. Um, we call it stick bait. You can actually see the... Um, uh, cases on rocks and things in the fall. They're like these sticks that are glued together. The fish will actually eat those. It's not a great hatch to try and fish because the hatch occurs at night, so does the egg laying. So you're never really going to see the October caddis, the size 8 October caddis around here on the river during the daytime. However, we have about three other species of caddis fly that are smaller, size 14, size 12, I even fish to 16. Um, and they will be on the water during the daylight, and you can catch them with a, an orange uh, caddis pattern in the fall. Uh, important caddis, it's really simple. The black caddis, apple caddis, cinnamon caddis, the dark blue sage, if you're going to fish the park, it's very common, the tiny black sage. In a nutshell, you don't have to carry very much. You need a size 16, size 14 tan. You need a size 16, size 14 green. And you need a size 18 black. Now, in the fall, if you like to fish in the park, I love to fish a size 16 brown. If you're up in the Smoky Mountain National Park, I like to fish Cataloochee and some other rivers over there. The caddis over there are a little bit darker. It's probably a micro caddis. I think it's actually one of the glossosomids, uh, but it can be extremely productive on Bradley's Fork, Cataloochee, and a few other rivers up there. Um, and that's a good fall pattern, but it's actually super simple. Stone flies. Those are the famous salmon fly. Do we have those around here? Yes! We do! We do have them, but we probably get a big hatch once every decade. All right, and that's what they're famous for because they have a three-year lifespan. 
But let's look at some of the stone flies that we are going to have. Now remember, stone flies are unique. They'll have a lifespan of one to three years. Uh, typically, it's like two or three. They're one of the few insects that's in the water all the time because of that. So if nothing else has happened, stone flies are a good thing to go with, particularly the nymphs. The dry fly fishing on stone is a little bit less reliable, I'll just say. And the reason for that is most stone flies do not swim to the surface to hatch. They crawl out of the river. They crawl out of the river. So there is no hatch. The adult is never there. The only time that the fish actually have access to the stoneflies is when they lay their eggs. The nymph, they're easy to identify because they're going to have two wing pads. Mayflies only have one. Caddisflies only have one. They have two claws on each foot. They're going to have two tails, two antenna. Everything comes in pairs. The adults are down wings. They're very clumsy flyers. They have a lifespan of one to three years. And this right here is one of what makes our area so famous in trout fishing, is the golden stone. But this guy is actually a hunter. He eats other bugs. He's a predator. But this is probably the most common pattern for a stonefly. It's called a stimulator. But the one, the one exception to the dry fly fishing around here uh, in the summertime or normal fishing time is the yellow sally. Here is what the yellow sally looks like. Notice how their wings are laid flat. Um, I will say you this though, when a stonefly hits the water, they're going to be very active. You can fish a stonefly with a caddis. That's a yellow sally pattern, size 14. They're all going to be about the same size. And last tip on the stoneflies, best time of day to fish them, dawn and dusk. They always move at dawn and dusk. You can fish them year round. You go out and fish them today. Terrestrials. Terrestrials, remember, their eggs are laid where? on the land. So the only time the fish actually have access to them is in the adult stage. So I'm going to give you a few that are really common around here. Inchworm. Uh, it's very common in woodland streams. Look for overhanging branches. Um, the fish will feed on these on the surface, but they also feed on them subsurface. Because when these things hit the water, they're going to eventually drown. They're not going to float, and they're going to go down. Grasshoppers and crickets. A lot of people don't think we have good grasshopper fishing around here, and the answer is yes, we don't have good grasshopper fishing around here. Why? We don't have meadow streams, okay? Now, I will say there are some streams that do have grass along the sides. Uh, pay attention when you're walking out to the streams. We have a small grasshopper around here. It's like that big, and they're green, and they can be in abundance. If you're walking to the stream and you start seeing those flying around, uh, typically, I'm going to be looking for them in August. That's the best time around here to fish for grasshopper patterns. So I'm going to be using a small green, or I'm going to go a little bit bigger, and I got one I call uh, uh, the corn-fed hopper. It's a, a yellow, pale yellow belly. Uh, the ideal place to, to fish these things is along the banks, though. Fish them along the banks. Matter of fact, if you can hit a tree or a rock and bounce it into the water, that can really help your presentation. Ants, I'm going to give you a little tip on the ants. People miss this. September, August, September is good ant season. If you're fishing the river and all of a sudden you see a bunch of uh, very supple rings on the water, and then it quits. And then you see a bunch of rings on the water. The first thing is like, did the wind just blow? And you start paying attention. If you, see, if you hear the wind blow, and then all of a sudden you see these really supple rings the trout are gorging on ants because the wind blows them out of the trees they fall the water boom 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 they take them out now they don't have to break the surface to eat an ant ants sink really quickly and trout survive by not exposing themselves to birds so uh, just a little tip the smallest rises are usually the biggest fish because they've learned to feed without disturbing the water um, I try this one in a 12, I carry that one in a 16, I don't even carry the red 20s anymore. Alright, well I guess that's it. <laughs>